Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, being here today. And um, uh, and maybe you can help me out um, uh, with the... Hi, Steve. Uh, maybe you can help me out with a poem that uh, I love, but I have always found very challenging. And... Um, I actually want to start with a very short. Yeah, is there a question? No, I think it was just a cough. Uh, I want to start with a very short poem by Pound that came later, that came even later than the. Um, so-called excerpt from Canto 115. I mean, there there isn't any more uh, of, of Canto 115 except this, what he called this excerpt. But I wanna read, I wanna start with a very short poem which Pound called Canto 120. So it's an even later poem. I have tried to write paradise. Do not move. Let the wind speak that is paradise. Let the gods forgive what I have made. Let those I love try to forgive what I have made. Um, so that's a poem that comes even later than the poem that we're going to talk about today. And let me read uh, from Canto 115. The scientists are in terror, and the European mind stops. Wyndham Lewis accepted blindness rather than have his mind stop. Night under the wind mid garophony, the petals are almost still. Mozart, Linnaeus, Sulmona. When one's friends hate each other, how can there be peace in the world? Their asperities diverted me in my green time. A blown husk that is finished, but the light sings eternal. A pale flare over marshes where the salt hay whispers to tides change. Time, space, Neither life nor death is the answer. And of men seeking good, doing evil. In mine Heimat, where the dead walked and the living were made of cardboard. Um. Well, first impressions. Grim. It's Karen. Karen, hi. Karen, hi. Yeah, it is so terribly pertinent right now. Uh, it felt that way to me too. Yeah, the, particularly when one fr one's friends hate each other, how can there be peace in the world? That seems to me so descriptive of my experience right now. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say that's the line in the poem that had the most resonance for me, right? It's a, it's a line that's, had, that's always had resonance for me. But, but um, to uh, me, it just seemed um, the asperities are so much keener and edgier now. 
I'm talking about my own contemporary situation and the global yeah. situation. Yeah. Yeah. Any other first 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 responses of men seeking good doing evil i think that also describes what we're experiencing mm -hmm. yeah yes. yeah yeah denise good morning <laughs> um yeah the the last line um suggest to me with its its cardboard cardboard men that all of the significant contribution is in the past and that mm. the people living in the world contemporaneously with the poem and making decisions are um shallow worthless yeah ted Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I've read the poem many times, and each time I read it, I found that I was trying to take it apart. Mm. And that I, I found that experience intriguing and deepening. Today, when you read it, I decided to close my eyes and just listen to you. And when it was over, I was overcome, not with the specifics that I've been following for a week, hmm. but I was overcome with sadness. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I too. Yeah. Lloyd? Yes. Um, this reminds me of the experience that I often uh, am confronted with yeah. in the difference between a, let's say, a printed score of music and the performer's uh, take on it. And very often you can look at a piece of music and it really doesn't say very much hmm. or it says things that are confusing and the performance, the execution of it ideally reveals things and it makes it convincing. Uh, yesterday, Susan played for me a, a cut of Ezra Pound reading some of his poetry. And it came as a revelation and a surprise. His reading is like a passionate incantation. Every mm. sound is filled with a kind of tremulous emotion that is so focused and so continuous and unrelenting that you are simply carried away by the, the overwhelming fervor and conviction of the of the of the lines of the poetry mm. and that is not revealed by the the look on the page or the reading of it mm. the reading of it may bring entirely different values but but pounds own uh his his own uh reading of of his own poems really revealed something about what his feeling was about poetry and it reminds me in a way of the way lots of people have conducted stravinsky's pieces with more color with less color more details nobody comes close to the mm. essence that he produces when he conducts his own music mm. was 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 any of the recordings that you heard of of this poem? No, no, not at all. Yeah. No, um, and I played him an early, early recording and yeah. not late in his life, so that one heard the. And what I was so struck by is how he carries the end of one line. He never lets it stop. It it 
continues so that there's your hanging in suspense and uh, for the next uh, lines that come and I was very I've been str struggling with the poem too but I was very struck by the um, nature images and the and the wind and the petals hardly moving and the and the seagrass and the tide and that just just would make me weep about it and then I did find and I'm sure you all know the fragment from Canto 115 that was was published and that he never uh, did anything with and that is so passionate and is asking forgiveness and um, it's it's an amazing um, fragment and I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, say again which which um, which poem that was? It's a fragment from Canto One Fifteen. Okay, uh, but that's that's this one. No, this is a different one that appeared later. I'll try to send oh, I, it to huh. you. I I know this poem exists in several versions, and um, one of the versions. For those of you who are interested in the in the technical side, is um, has no stanza breaks, and it's awful. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't remember where that appeared, but that that seems not to be any kind of official version. It may have been someone copying it wrong. Uh, it was published in some journal and the the spacing i ju just want to say that the spacing in this in this poem in this version which is both a it seems to me this was the the final version and that was um that was published in the paris review in maybe 1961 no, 62, I guess, um, which has the stanza breaks, just um, it ma makes an enormous difference in um, in the way you read the poem and the way you hear the poem. There is a recording of Pound reading this poem. And um, I didn't send it to you partly because I don't like it so much. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's, he was very old when he read it, when he made this recording or, or, or it was just recorded. I don't, I don't know what the circumstances of the, of the recording were, but um, it's so, um, it doesn't have that passion or that sense of, it, it was it was just I mean it's interesting because it's so it's so blank um, um, I heard a story about a graduate student who went to Italy to find pound uh, very late in pound's life. And um, um, he he found the house and he rang the doorbell or knocked on the door and Pound answered the door. And the student said, oh, Mr. Pound, how are you? And he said, I'm crazy. And he slammed the door. Oh. <laughs> I, 
I think it's a true story. That sounds <laughs> Nick. Uh, yes, uh, I, I've been muted because I have a major cold here. So I, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll just try and say a couple of things. I I was very challenged to use your word by this poem too, of course. Uh, and I thought of the exercise because the first line just grabs me. The scientists are in terror. And some things, I, I wondered, of course, which scientists and why are they in terror? And I thought it might be a useful exercise for me to go by, go, go and make a timeline of Ezra Pound's life in relation mm. to Canto 115. Mm. And it was very informative to me. And I'm not going to, but I, I wanted to see which associations that come to my mind as I read it, did he actually live through? And of course, he did live through both world wars, uh, yeah. and, and and through the atomic bomb, and he was, as we know, uh, arrested for treason in 1945 when he returned to the United States for having broadcast fascist propaganda to the U.S. Uh, he was acquitted from that, but declared mentally unstable and committed to a hospital in Washington at age 61, uh, well before he, re he read this, he wrote this poem and so forth. I won't go through it all. If anybody wants it, I, I could just send it to you if you could. It took a lot of work for me to try and reconstruct uh, those correspondences between uh, things that occurred to me as I read the poem and was he there, in fact, and his age. And... Uh, one thing he might have learned, might well have heard, he might have heard Albert Einstein say, if I had foreseen Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I would have torn up my formula in 1905. So those, there's a scientist who preceded. But anyway, I won't, I won't go on anymore, but oh, I, no, I, it was a useful exercise. And it's, it's you know, it's about a, third of a page if anyone wanted or I could send uh, it to anyone wants yeah, it I could do it for whatever use it might be I'd I'd love to see it and maybe um uh maybe Marita could send it to um please to, absolutely I'll, I'll, I'll I'd be send, happy I'll to send. share it with everybody yeah that would be great yeah that would be great. Well, I'll do that. That. yes and Jim wanted to say something please is, is Salmona the camp in which he was held um near Pisa you know, it might have been, I don't know the answer to that, but I think, I actually think this reference is to, uh, is to Ovid and it, and that, that, that there are, um, that the, th th there's, Maybe a kind of double meaning here. I don't. I actually don't know about um, whether that was where he was held. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a camp. Right. It's um, a. It's a very strange trio. It's a very strange trio, and I I'd love to talk about that. Um, so uh, we let's come back to that. Um, but it is it is a very strange trio. It's it, when I talk about the poem being challenging, that's one of the that's one of the places. And I I anyway, I find it very moving, but I don't entirely understand it. Well, the other thing I was gonna say, I mean, there's sort of war imagery throughout, it seems to me. I mean, the, the flare over the marshes, I don't think is just uh, the moon. Um, and, and well, the last part, the, 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 where the dead walk, but the men seek, do, seeking good doing evil, I think is also probably a, a reference to Pound's position on the war. Yeah, I, 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 Lisa, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, following up on the earlier gentleman's remarks about the politics of this poem, 
you know, I don't know a lot about them, but I do know he was affiliated with fascism on an, in a few ways. Yeah. And he does talk here about men seeking to do good that do evil. I just wonder, and then he quotes the Eine uh, Meine Heimat, uh, the German mm -hmm. homeland text. So I wonder, did, I, I wonder about what Pound's feelings were about his uh, sympathizing with the Nazis. Did, did he regret it? Is, is there any element of that in this poem? Any recognition that he had, perhaps in thinking he was pursuing good, did evil? Before, before we answer that question, I was, do you recognize the, in Mina Heimat, do you recognize what that is, um, where that comes from? No, didn't you give us a reference? To oh yeah, oh, that's my reference. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I, I know it's, there's some, it's very similar to a, a, a phrase in a folk song, but not exactly. And I think it also comes from somewhere else, but I can't place it. So I thought, oh, maybe, maybe you knew the answer to this. Uh, but but <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. So uh, so Hume, yeah, yeah. Well, I I just wonder in 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 relation to this question, <clears throat> um, wh whether there's a, a a a an answer in in Canto one twenty that you read um, um, at at the outset, where where he he sort of gives up and says, hey, just you know, look for paradise in the wind. I I don't know anything about it. Or am I wrong about that? Well, no. <laughs> um, I think the it's the last line of that Canto 120. Let those I love try to forgive what I have made. Huh. And that's the that was the thing that struck me so much. And I mean, Lisa my answer to your question is yes that in at the very end of his life and i think it's in this poem and i do think this is a very very autobiographical poem and that he is i mean when one's friends hate each other how can there be peace in the world their asperities diverted me and that's a pretty, it's a pretty devastating confession of something that he, um, something that he has come to regret and I think profoundly regret. Um, um, uh, uh, other, uh, uh, other other reactions to to I think that's a really important question. I mean, one of the challenges of Pound and one of the problems with Pound is the whole biographical element and how really complicated that was to have a great poet do so much damage. And uh, uh, um, and that we have to deal with it, and that you know there were Pound got a lot of prizes, and after after the war, and a lot of great poets and great American poets really supported him and 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 help try to help him. I mean, better to be in a mental hospital than in an electric chair. Denise. Actually, it was the advocacy of other poets. 
um, many of whom wrote letters that, that placed him in the mental hospital rather than prison. You know, it ended up being a, a compassionate uh, sentence. You know, another thing that, that struck me in this poem, though, though I don't know if it's relevant, is the flower, the what, Garofini? Now, yeah, those, gar Garofini. Garofini. Yeah. So those are, carna that's the carnation family. And right. the little pink one is the symbol of the Este family. Um, that was a dynasty of Northern Italy. And I don't know enough about, I mean, they produced popes and military leaders and all kinds of things. And then of course their, their dynasty crumbled, but it's also a very fragrant flower. Mm -hmm. And when they're in bloom, you know, the wind carries that fragrance, but you know, again, that's an ephemeral thing. There, there's, you know, the, the breezes and in the grass, sea grass and the tides, these are all momentary ephemeral things. And that's one of the things that caught me. It reminded me of, you know, the faces in the railway station. It's mo momentary. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's, that's a great connection to the pound's most famous, most famous lines. Um, 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 well, uh, let's go back. I need to unmute. I'm so, oh, sorry. Oh, Karen. Hi, Lloyd. I just want to return into the poem. Yeah. To the texture and follow in the poem because we're taking it a bit out into the pound's feelings, which we can't really know. We know what he wrote. And if we stick to sort of what he wrote and find clues in that. So the men doing, seeking good and doing evil are also the scientists and the terrible confessions of Oppenheimer and the refusal of many of the German uh, people who the scientists and physicists from Europe who worked uh, at Los Alamos, who then spoke against as powerfully as they could uh, against the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki against uh, the government's wishes to do that. So there's a kind of helplessness in uh, men seeking good, doing evil, and mm -hmm. they're, the issue to return to somebody that we're not talking about really, and that's Wyndham Lewis, as mm -hmm. if he is some sort of avatar for Pound or for people Pound knew. He's a painter, a portrait painter. So he knows people, he painted Pound. So is there something that Lewis was able to reveal? And Lewis, accepted blindness, what does that mean? Is it literal, not literal, or metaphoric, not seeing everything? In Rather than have his mind stop. In other words, he could not, he's trying to talk about somebody he knew, it must have been some sort of intimacy to when you're a sitter and a portrait painter, there's no. a certain relation that develops in, knowledge of the sitter. If we look at the sergeant exhibit now, the way in which he knew who he was painting. If you look at all the clues, you will see personalities come. He's an exquisite portrait painter. I don't know Lewis's painting of Pound, but I'm wondering what he meant by not seeing because if he saw, then it would stop his mind. And I'm wondering if there's also a mea culpa from Pound in there that he did not really see uh, men seeking good doing evil, clearly. And he accepted that blindness to fascism rather than being overwhelmed. I mean, what does it mean when your mind stops 
what is that? Is it can, it can be all the way from, I can't take it anymore to madness. So there's such an extension in the image of not letting your mind stop that opens a lot of the poem for me and in questions. Yeah, right. Nick, Nick, what, what are you going to say? Yes, I was just thinking I could answer that specific question about Wyndham Lewis. Uh, he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor, mm -hmm. which was reducing his vision. And uh, the only way I could think of it, literally, he accepted blindness rather than having his mind stop. His mind would only stop by his own self uh, destruction in a literal sense. Now that doesn't mean figuratively, it doesn't have deeper meanings, but in fact, he had an inoperable brain tumor. Uh, which, which, le which, which led to his blindness. Yeah, yes. And, and but he didn't stop writing. He wrote, he stopped painting, he stopped his artwork, but he didn't stop writing. And, um, I think the I've always taken this blindness as quite literal uh, and not blindness to the political situation, but I, I don't see any reason not to have that. I mean, you can't help but have that other level when you when you read this. Um, But compared to, he's comparing Wy Wyndham Lewis to the to the European mind. Boyd, to piggyback on exactly what you're saying, no. uh, Mike Stefan put in the chat that, did you see that, that the mind of Europe between America and Russia in the Cold War buildup appears to have stopped and gotten stuck in the crossfire? And he relates this to Lewis you know, continuing writing when he couldn't see anymore. Yeah, thank you. I the the uh, I, I I I apologize that that I can't really read the text messages because uh, they go by so fast. Uh, uh, I mean, worry. the chat the chat messages go by so fast. Um, but yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, you had something. You had a very some interesting thing a, a minute a few minutes ago that went by too quickly for me to uh, acknowledge, but um, uh, please feel free to talk because I I can't always see the, the, the chat messages. Well, when you were a while ago, Lloyd, when you were talking about their Heimat Zoo, I remembered, but that was Wagner that Elliot quoted in the wasteland, Frisch wird der Wind der Heimat Zoo. Um, but, um, it's the word I, you're, the word Heimat is homeland mm -hmm. is certainly in the same um, it's the same okay. word, but in Mina Heimat is, I mean, I like that illusion. I think in I think the this phrase that Pound quotes in, I think not correct German, if any of you know German better than I do, you you, you can verify this. Um, uh, it's not exactly the same phrase. And I think in Meine Heimat is actually, from, I th there is a folk song that has something like this phrase in it. <clears throat> and you know, homeland is just Heimat in German is just a very charged word in, um, you know, during the war and after the war. Um, it's correct or not, uh, depends on the context. Um, it would be correct if it were a phrase, an adverbial phrase, uh, come to my uh, homeland. Uh, if it's static in just in my homeland, then it wouldn't be correct. Yeah, but well, I think it's, I, it's not homeland here. It's just the home, isn't it? And I think no, it is, in, is homeland. I know Heimat. Yeah, Heimat is homeland. Homeland. Country. Yeah, my home country. 
Oh. Time is home. Uh, what does pound? It would be mine anyway, ER. Not exactly. Okay. Um, unless you're inviting somebody to come to your home country. Ah. Uh, say, come in my Heimat. Ah. Uh, yeah, I know. It, it intakes the accusative with movement towards, oh, but um, it yeah. takes the dative with position in. So the, the ER is the dative ending, the E is the accusative ending. If he's got an E, then as um, then uh, as Bill says, it's it's movement towards come into my homeland, as it were, um, move into it. If it's in my nair heimat, then it would be presence, stationary presence in the homeland. But um, so um, so in the version you've given, where it's accusative, um, it would it would be movement towards. But um, I've actually seen a version where. There is an R ending, um, and it would seem to imply stationary presence in, but I, neither of them enables me to pick up the illusion. And it seems too sort of general a fragment to yeah. trace to a very specific occasion. Yeah. What Bill I, said. Well, what is his homeland? Ah. The United States. <laughs> well, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. That's a very good question, and and he he, he is it is is it Italy? Is it America? Um, uh, why is it in German? Um, uh, it's one of the puzzles about this poem. I've Bill. I've seen that version where someone has added an R. And I don't think it was Pound who did that. Uh, yes, I wasn't sure. I I, I, um, I I was sort of casting around to see if there were other versions, came across that one that wasn't right. in a position to judge its authority. So it might just have been an error introduced by someone mistranscribing. I, I'm under the impression that it was someone trying to correct Pound. Mm. Uh, but, well, but, uh, but that came yeah. that that version came and went very, yeah. very quickly. Well, but Pound's scholarship is um, uh, incredibly extensive and wide ranging, but yeah. apparently not to be trusted in a lot of areas. You know, his his view of Chinese is, um, and the sort of pictographic nature of the characters is derived from Fenelosa, I don't think is something which real sinologists would um, endorse very much. and. Uh, whether his German is as unreliable as his Chinese, I'm not not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, does meine Heimat with the word Heimat always have double meanings for persons who are born and raised in one country and for whatever reason have been have chosen? to join another country, have been forced to join another country, have been exiled, have become immigrants, uh, where when you ask people like that, what, what is your homeland? You're probably going to get two answers, yeah. especially if they chose a different homeland. And when he talks about the European mind, I would wonder, does he identify with that mind rather than, say, the a mind of his place of birth, United States? Right. Denise? Uh, much later on, Salman Rushdie, who wrote a book titled Imaginary Homelands, spoke about um, the situation of being multiply rooted, as he called it, because you know his family went from India to Pakistan after partition, and then to Britain. Um, you know, uh, and he said this was a problem, not so much of root rootlessness, but of being multiply rooted, of having too many, um, or a surplus, or a confusing number. Of homeland, and of course, Pound went from the the states to England, and then back to the states, and back and forth between the states and Italy. So, you know, perhaps he had that same problem, and and Heimat is 
is ambiguous, as Karen suggests. Yeah. Uh, let's. I want to go back to um, the sort of be beginning stanzas of the poem, and and really sort of think about what what I mentioned earlier was that about the there was a, a version of this poem that had that was not in separate stanzas, and that I I didn't like it and that it's, it's certainly not the official version anymore but what what do you make of these stanzas as as separate stanzas and and how pound is putting this together with first is about the scientists the european mind stops wyndham lewis would rather be blind than have his mind stop then this ha hauntingly beautiful image of the the of the carnations, and then this little list of are they all are they all names? Are they two names and a place? Is is this 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 strange list of figures or places that don't seem to have any connection to each other. And I'm wondering what you, what, what, what do you make of this whole opening poetically? What is, what, what is it, what do you feel when you're, when you're reading it? This, the, the, this leap from Wyndham Lewis to Carnations to Mozart. Oh, Stephen, you're 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 muted. I I think it's uh, representative of the style that he uses all through his poetry of a superposition where he's just going to lay an image, a type of an image or a stanza on a stanza. So it, it feels like a pastiche, but it's intended to have our mind create connective tissue between them. That it's le leaving us, um, uh, it, it, it's, I mean, it's demanding more of us as a reader because he's not, and I think he's intentionally not laying them together so they fit an easy narrative as if we're supposed to see them laid on top of each other. And, and, and Lord, can I make one more quick comment about Homeland too? Sure. Oh, please. Um, uh, I think uh, Pound's Homeland, I think Pound as a young man had you know something of a God complex that he believed he would be able to take all of the world, all the world's culture and synthesize it in one mind. And I think the sadness by the end of his life is to finally realize how um, you know lost he had made himself, how he had you know this 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 wonderful will to power. We admire the aesthetic aspects of it, and then we sort of damn his political aspects of it. We realized how much damage he did. But I believe that that's part of that goal, as if his mind could contain all these broken pieces, and he and and synthesize into a whole. I think where the Cantos fail is they're not really synthesized, but the pleasure of it is in some good poems, we begin to synthesize it. We find connections as we're hearing in this discussion that, that give us a sense of place. You know, we're making poetry our homeland. Hmm. Uh, doesn't, yes. doesn't the next canto yeah. comments self-reflexively on the impossibility of the synthesis to which Stephen refers there's that line isn't there about his errors and his wrecks lying about him and he says you know rather tangently I cannot make it cohere he's aspired to an epic which will contain history and be somehow comprehensive and exhaustive you know contain the mind of Europe or even a bigger mind than that and yet um uh, all he's assembled really uh, is a bunch of um fragments which lack the coherence he desiderated 
except that I suppose Stephen's right that at any given moment we can supply connections of our own, but those connections are liable to differ from one person to the next and have a certain arbitrary character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did those, oh, did those oh, oh, Marita? Yeah. No, and there's a lot of, of, of activity all of a sudden, and I just oh. want to make sure I don't lose anybody there. Jonathan's okay. got Jonathan. his hands up. Yeah. And um, and then there's a, a comment in the, the chat from Ted. So go ahead, Jonathan. Bill, uh, Bill yeah. Okay. Back to this case, it's me. Um, okay. The uh, Another way of looking at that line is that Mozart and Linnaeus are both 18th century uh, figures. They are, you know, associated with a kind of orderly, uh, way of putting art and science together. Uh, a cheesy check of Wikipedia indicates that Solmona was leveled by an earthquake at the beginning of the 18th century and rebuilt in a kind of Baroque style. So there may be something temporal that's putting those three together. Uh, just a thought. Um. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, Susan? Yes, I, I'm interested in this conversation about fragmentation, um, whether he intends the fragmentation, whether it's deliberate, or whether it's just the way his mind works and it's highly free associative. And it reminds me a lot of abstract painting in a way where you can't you can't connect certain images, or it's very hard. It's difficult. But how do, are you moved by that? Does it do? Something? I'm I'm frustrated. The first I'm first I'm frustrated as we talk, and I hear it re repeated. Then I wouldn't. Yes, I am moved. Yes, I am. It, it it's also the, the images that kept coming into my mind were those of nuclear winter or what people what people describe as what it would be it's, it's everything stops mm -hmm. just it isn't even death it's just the wind stops i mean there's yeah no nature even but there's some nature there is in the poem yeah in the poem yeah yeah, yeah. In the poem. I want to address it's the okay. nature that i want to address if I'm being heard now. Yes, Aaron. Okay, I'm going to take the first three, if we call them strophes, because the breaks between them, like breath. The first one gives you the terror, the terror of the mind stopping, blindness, mm -hmm. very specific, historic, personal reference. Then you move to what I call sort of the most poets do it. It's you take a great ah, of sort of relief. I call it the Matthew Arnold moment when you remember that you are in a natural world that does refresh itself. That world, of course, that natural world is very much under threat from the scientists that are in terror of what they have done, we might say. But it's the night wind and it's almost still and these carnations, which as Denise pointed out, they have very specific reference, but maybe it's just a color or petals that are almost still because there's a kind of stillness. And then contributors to culture. And I'm mindful of Lloyd reminding us that Silmona also is associated with Ovid. And therefore you have a musician, a beneficial biologist, a scientist, a botanist, and a poet. And that goes along with the natural world. There is a cultural world. And that cultural world is part of the European mind. 
that made these contributions. So here's these, oh my God. And then, but here's nature, here's culture that we can depend on. And then we go back to, oh my God, one's friends hate each other. So there's this breathing kind of alternation that moves me yeah. along in the poem, allows me to take a moment of, oh, it can't be all that bad. Oh God, it is that bad. Uh, I Thank you so much. Um, these, these, these figures are, they're figures of vast culture. Uh, I mean, there's almost no, who, who has, who is greater than Mozart? I mean, maybe Shakespeare and, and, and Pound isn't, isn't going there. But Linnaeus, the scientist who really, who sort of names everything, um, everything. And, and then, and then this reference to Ovid and Ovid is also, you know, a, 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 a great poet of, of, of vastness and tr the metamorphoses is, 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 is such a huge thing. The other thing about, anyone know what happened to Ovid biographically? Was he exiled yeah. or something? He was exiled. Yeah. Why? Why? Well, we don't know. I don't think. Or he fell foul of Augustus, but we, no one, no one seems to know right. exactly what he did to irritate him. But your, your, I, I can see your point, Lloyd. That oh. um, you're confronted by these three oh. figures. The, 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 the little group seems rather arbitrary, and you come up with yeah. the notion of exhaustiveness as a way of. Um, uh, connecting them, and that of course feeds into the um, inclusivist aspirations of Pound as a poet. But once, but going back to your original comment that you, you although you're moved by the poem and um, you fit, don't feel as if you understand it in the way that you understand other poems, which we've treated of here, isn't it in the very nature of this kind of poem that a different concept of understanding needs to come into play? And um, here you come up with a very ingenious and persuasive reading of, of this little trio, but one's necessarily left feeling that it's conjectural and speculative and that might not be the, the reason for their grouping at all. And one's bound to be left with that. There can't be any kind of decisive determination of meaning in the way that there can be with other poems. Well, I, I completely agree with you. And I am, in a way, what I'm, what I'm, sort of trying to confront. And I, 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 I think Karen is 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 with me on, on on this, is that, as I read the poem, and I'm reading it not exclusively on an intellectual level. I'm just I'm reading it as a poem. And when I get to that line, it makes me want to cry. Mm -hmm. And I have to, you know, and then I have these, <laughs> thank you, these, these ingenious <laughs> attempts at, a, at, at an explanation that I, you know, that I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not absolutely sure I'm, I'm not saying that I'm right about this, but that that's how I, mm -hmm. that's how I, I, I am trying to, how I try to decipher it, uh, at least for myself. But I know that before I try to decipher it, when I read night under wind mid garophony, the petals are almost still Mozart, Linnaeus, Sulmona. I, it, it breaks my heart. And, and then there has to be something about these great figures. And I, and I do take Sulmona to, 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 to be a reference to Ovid. 
I mean, yeah. and, and that could that could be wrong. But that in relation to the European mind stops. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the right. in, in you know in the first world war and in the second world war. Uh um I I I I find that heartbreaking. And then and then the leap to when one's friends hate each other, how can there be peace in the world? Which is just, you know, as 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 you were saying earlier, it's what it's exactly what we're facing now. Yeah. Lloyd. Yes, please. Um, the sign when you speak of those first lines and ask, when I look at that first line, the scientists are in terror. It occurs to me that that is a purely modern phenomenon. Yes. That science historically was an exciting, pioneering kind of thing. Right. In Linne Linnaeus, Linne hand, Linnaeus, in Linnaeus hand a naming, which Linnaeus, kind of oh, sorry. <laughs> takes me back to the biblical, you know, that, that moment of eating the apple and, you know, bringing di disaster and destruction on humanity. You know, have we gotten to that place? The scientists are in terror. We've invented a way to destroy the world. And then when I see that line you're, that we're talking about Mozart, Linnaeus, Silmona, I think of the march of history and mm -hmm. Mozart, you know, the beauty, the 18th century, all the development then, Linnaeus, the development of science, and then the camps. Yeah. Destruction. Yeah. I, wanna... I was just I was just gonna say Linnaeus wasn't, as far as we know, he wasn't in terror. No. <laughs> no. Lloyd, I wanna let I Michael... mean, maybe Galileo was, you know. I mean, maybe. some of those well, arch those uh astronomical discoveries in the Renaissance may have brought terror. Right. Because you realize you're kind of unseating the worldview. But right. but they're not in the poem. <laughs> no, right. Yes, uh, Stephen and oh, I'm sorry. Was Michael? Did you have My, your? Michael's you been first? reading a little bit. Okay, so both yeah. Michael, Michael and, Stephen. and then Stephen. Yeah, we need police. To... <laughs> Thank you. Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. Michael, Linnaeus, um, name things, but from the point of view of uh, scientists like Darwin and Asa Gray in the late 1800s named them confusedly and incorrectly, that he was systemizing, but he didn't understand the biology and the function. And there was a overturning of his system of naming going forward oh. into biology by the time of Ezra. I don't know how much he would have been aware of this, or am I painting something he didn't have, but very interesting. With what Bill was saying on the German and this line of Mozart, who I think of particularly as a virtuoso, um, Linnaeus as somebody who did not actually endure or put the knowledge together in a way that lasted and the bombed out um, camps, no doubt, but going back to Ovid, but there's a kind of dissent here. And I think that this welcome to my homeland is maybe in a way saying, um, come in, be guilty with me, be confused with me. This is the state of the world. And you are part of it and come here with me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I just have to take issue a little bit. I mean, Linnaeus' system is still in existence. Um, there have been lots of reinterpretations of classification, but certainly not in Pound's time. This is a very modern critique and I, I don't think that fits into this particular um, narrative. Thank you. And I and I I would actually disagree about Mozart. I think Mozart is the composer with the most 
profound human feelings and and range of of feelings definitely virtuosic but that there's something else going on St Stephen is next I was going to uh, add this, this this connects uh, to some of the comments that just came out about you know where does he stand in relationship to this world and this homeland and I thought of the lines from Moberly Pound's wonderful poem so I went back and got it so we could hear it so I wouldn't butcher the quote um, I think Pound felt so unappreciated in America he exiled himself he it was a choice because he felt a barrenness behind him. He, he I idealized uh, European culture and then found out maybe this is not going to sustain the way I hoped. And the lines from Moberly, he says, he's talking about the first world war, but he says, um, there died a myriad and of the best among them for an old bitch gone bad in the teeth for a botched civilization and he goes on from there too. But he, this wonderful image of saying this great culture, this great Europe that he idealized is just an old bitch gone bad in the teeth. And oh, before thanks. that, they sent the young men out to battle and he watched friends uh, die. So I think he, he, he thought he was gonna have a, a homeland in this culture. And as he's aged now, he's realized how it's maybe the antithesis of that. It's not going to not going to sustain. Karen. I again return to the poem. Lloyd, you read so beautifully. You remind us that the pound is a poet. This is music. And I'm not even going to try to read what Lloyd read so beautifully. But the stanza beginning with night under wind. Um, if you just listen again uh, to Lloyd read it, and then the transition to the stanza that begins when one's friends, you are going to hear the difference between poetry and prose. You are going to hear the music of Pound come through, which does, and it's the rhythm. It's the stress variations that are in here. That are that make us come back and back to it, to listen to it, mm -hmm. to read it aloud. When we only read it on the page, we forget poetry is music, and the stress alternations are so crucial. I, I think one of the most one of the most interesting words in the poem, or one of the most evocative words in the poem is under mm -hmm. and i think it's that kind of that pounds poetic instinct mm -hmm. that i mean night under wind yes is so beautiful and haunting and what does it mean and it's mysterious and um um uh it's th this this kind of delicacy about it, but that also very here ve very late in his 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 life, it's very inventive, also without seeming forced or pretentious or overstated or or underlined. Um, it's just um, it's just such delicacy mm -hmm. and. And the way the poem moves from section to section, from, from stanza to stanza, yeah. um, and I, 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 I really, I totally agree with you that we we mustn't forget that um, um, that it's a poem, yeah. but it's a very personal poem, and and that when he gets to their asperities diverted me in my green, green time. time and and how what a Saying what an amazing head. thing to admit and that he was capable of 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 admitting that <laughs> gail gail i you haven't said anything and i and I, I, talking about this as a poem, I, I, I'm, I'm just so interested, curious about what you, what you're 
take on this is forgive me for calling on you without your raising your hand. You're, you're muted. Can you unmute? Gail, can you unmute? Hit the space bar, Gail. Oh, just hit the, oh, there, there you go. People haven't heard my oohs and ahs. No, we haven't. I can't, I, I, I wondered if you would say anything about Elizabeth Bishop's visit to him. Oh, I was going to, yeah. Um, uh, there's a wonderful poem about Pound by Elizabeth Bishop called Visits to St. Elizabeth's. Pound was in right. St. Elizabeth's Hospital, which is the mental hospital near Washington. Uh, this was after he was, you know, came back, was taken back to the United States. And there's a really wonderful poem, um, Visits to St. Elizabeth's, which, and which never mentions Pound, but we know who it is. And we know that as she was poet laureate at, the, at that time, and it was one of her obligations to, uh, to visit Pound. Uh, Can you um, read that line? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, um, uh, at any rate, very complex and very touching. And she, she hated visiting Pound. She hated that it was one of her obligations and she found she found him very, very difficult. Hmm. Um, Keep going. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I thanks for 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 mentioning that, Gail, because um, uh, it's it's a really important poem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you like this poem? Do I like this poem? Yeah. Oh, it's probably my the poem of Pounds that I really like the most. Yeah. It's been great to hear people um, talking about it. Great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I I. I, 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 we've, I don't think we've ever discussed it, but I share that feeling. It's my favorite pound poem. Would it be possible, Lloyd, to say more about the um, uh, tension between public reference and private reference in the poem? Because it, it seems to me that when he, in, in lines which you've um, spoken about as if they're relatively transparent and pellucid, uh, that there may be difficulties to do with the privacy of the reference. So when one's friends hate each other um, and their asperities diverted me in my green time, we don't really know which friends he's talking about. We don't know exactly in what way they were sharp or... Um, uh, um, uh, and um, in a way, he's, he's being intentionally cryptic, isn't he? Because he's not enlightening us he's choosing to make these references which he must know full well we can't possibly construe confidently you know yeah. it's it's a bit i mean, I mean well, I sort well, of... well the, the 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 autobi i mean he, i think he's really generalizing here and 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 he's not going into you know oh well i really got pissed off at, at um, or I really enjoyed when so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so had this argument. And I, I, and I guess um, the confession that he was, there was something really uh, shallow or mean about himself earlier, 
I that I in a way I don't need to know who it is he's talking about or which friends because I can I you know I can I can generalize about I, I I know now. I know now friends who were friends of each other who now hate each other because of their opposing political uh, positions. So I I'm not so worried about that, and um, I'm more. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not saying we should necessarily be worried about uh -huh. it, nor should we particularly. Um, try to solve the riddle or something, but I'm, yeah. I'm just sort of thinking that um, it uh, um, says something about his conception of um, uh, poetry's role and um, the question of expression versus communication, I suppose, um, yeah. that he includes these lines where um, that there's necessarily something hazy and shadowy and indeterminate and indefinite about them. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I just, I, I guess here I accept it because, because the writing is so beautiful and evocative and, and that the emotionally, the, the, the traject, the emotional trajectory of this of this poem is so complicated that these little stanzas really move over sort of vast, you know, bridge vast um, uh, differences. Uh, yeah, and then there's something touching about the shuffling alternation between attempts mm -hmm. to embrace the whole culture and yes statements which derive unashamedly and unapologetically from the personal life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think that's, I, I completely agree with you on that. That- Hume, um, did you want to add something to that? Well, just, yeah, I, well, I- yeah. Oh. I'm curious that we haven't talked about his lifelong anti-Semitism uh, and whether that's hanging over this poem and mm. possibly the regrets possibly when he says in meine heimat which implies bringing you to germany uh where the uh what the living were tried for um uh, you know i don't think one could leave that out or or ought to yeah Lloyd. Lloyd. Uh, sorry. Oh, uh, Hume. Yeah. 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 I, I actually and have Catherine. two. Okay. I have two questions. One. One is 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 some of some of this question of um, um, you, you know um, in indefiniteness. Does that relate at all? I, I'm not familiar with the earlier cantos, but is is there some context setting that goes on in earlier cantos that 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 uh, Pound refers to here. That, that's my first question. The second is that we we haven't touched on the the uh, blown husk. I don't think at all, and that, that's something that kind of I'm, I'm curious what people think. Of. Me too. Me too. <laughs> uh, Catherine, Are you, I'm, you're muted. I'm sorry. Um, I'd love to hear the response to that question because it's a it's with that interesting question about blown husk. I, I was going to raise a question about the final stanza, which, in contrast to the rest of the poem, which is evocative and allusive, this seems something clicks into place in this last because of the past tense, maybe. Mm -hmm. And meine Heimat, to me too sounds like it means Germany, it's in German. And, and also, um, in spite of Salman Rushdie's playing with the idea of homeland, it seems to me intrinsic in the meaning of the word is that it's one. You know, there's a, a coming to rest, it's home, family. Um, so it does seem to me to refer to Germany. 
and um, you know, in a horrifying way, minor Heimat. Mm -hmm. And then uh, if you could respond about the, what has changed here where the dead walked and the living were made of, there's something more definitive, although it's still elusive and I don't know that I get it and I don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, oh, to allude to his anti-Semitism. Anti yeah. I, you know, it's it's just one of the issues with Pound that um, I think he did regret it at at the at the very end of his life. He was virulent, a virulent anti-Semite for most of his life, and I. It's just one of the, you know, when I talk about the poem being challenging, it's pound, I'm, you know, it's pound being challenge, challenging because I know he's, I, I can see, I can read that he's a great poet and that for much of his life or for, for, for a substantial amount of his life, he was really a terrible person at person. And, His anti-Semitism uh, has a different character, though, doesn't it? Um, yeah. Than say Eliot. So, I mean, I, I don't. I, I, uh, Eliot, Eliot will write lines like, you know, the rats are underneath the piles, the Jew is underneath the lot. You know, so, something quite hideous and contemptible. Right. With Pound, my sense of his anti-Semitism is that it's it derives from. Uh, uh, um, an economic theory, you know, yeah. his, his identifying Usur usuria mm -hmm. as the yeah. root of all evil, and if that's the radix malorum, and if it's associated with the Jew, then the Jew then comes into his firing line. But mm -hmm. um, my, my, my wife if, was um, educated in um, at the University of Geneva and was taught by George Steiner, and yeah. she, she, she told me about attending a lecture of Steiner's, in which um, Steiner knew um, Pound, um, not well, I don't think, but a little. And Steiner in this lecture said that Pound would broadcast in the morning sort of terrible things about Jews. And then in the afternoon, he would spend his time helping particular Jews improve their lot, their condition, even escape from dif difficulty. And um, uh, I mean, not, none of that necessarily excuses him, but it, it does seem to suggest that just lumping him in with Eliot, uh, as if all anti-Semites are of the same nature, right. might be a problematic thing to do. And also thinking of him as growing regretful at the end might be problematic too. I think there might have been a sense in which he was divided even at the time. Um, uh, um, none, none of this is meant to be exculpatory, by the way. I mean, clearly, yeah, he, he he did behave um, terribly, discreditably. And I, I I liked very much Bill's reading, by the way, of the the last lines, which I hadn't quite thought of as taking us inside a concentration camp to the extent that they can do. But, yeah. yeah, Lloyd, Lloyd, yes, yes. who is uh, you? you? Yeah. Um, all of it seems. It's, Ultimately, when we put all these things together, it seems all connected. Starting with the idea that he tried to create paradise, and the, the end of the poem has to do with both his failure and the failure of the world. Mm -hmm. The uh, Also, the alteration between friends becoming not alteration, but altercation. Yeah. Remember that Mussolini started as doing good and ended up doing evil. Mm -hmm. And many German intellectuals and other intellectuals in the world supported the Nazis in the early days, thinking that the policies would, would really correct the devastation of the Second War, First War, mm -hmm. and the Weimar Republic and the rest in Germany. And then all of that collapsed. And so it seems to me that this is all 
a, auto, as you say, autobiographical, surely, but also a, not just a confession, but also a lament of his, of his failure, above all, to create the paradise that was in his early uh, mm -hmm. aspiration. You know, a, apropos the idea that he came to Europe with the thinking that that would be the salvation, would be the high civilization that he aspired to, you remember that he wrote and tried to persuade William Carlos Williams to uh, really get out of America, which we thought was so provincial, and to come to Europe and develop a kind of sophistication and worldview. And uh, William Carlos Williams tried it for a short time. I think he went to Paris mm -hmm. uh, and retreated from it, went back and found, as he said one day in one of his poems or in a statement, when I look out my bedroom window, uh, I am in, I see paradise or I see uh, the, the, my Athens is in my view from my be bedroom window, something of that kind. Everything depends on a red wheelbarrow. <laughs> and the, oh, well, there's another, another allusion to that. In any case, there's, you know, the, the business with, with anti-Semitism that Bill, Bill pointed out and you pointed out, it's, you think of Wagner who was a virulent anti-Semite and who spent a great deal of time with Jewish friends, admiring them, helping them. And you think also of, of people like Strauss, who wasn't really a virulent anti-Semite by any matter of means, but even at some risk of his own reputation, was supporting Jewish performers during the early days mm -hmm. of, uh, of the Nazi hegemony. So this, this is an old story with, with, and with Pound finally feeling some regret, God knows what it was like. But part of that, you know, yes, Pound's uh, uh, economic theories, but the anti-Semitism in many ways in Europe has been endemic. It's been part of the culture. You find it in Dostoevsky, you find it in many, many writers. And it is just like uh, the use of language is just a, a, a turn of the phrase, often by people who have no real contact with so-called Jews, uh, however they're characterized. Hmm. Yeah. No, no, it goes right back. I think of the prioress's tale in the Canterbury Tales, uh, for example, it goes, you know, yeah. all the way back, you know, pogroms in York in the even earlier than that in England. But, yeah, something that evidently builds something that evidently that prevails in England to, in the UK to this day. <laughs> in many ways, I mean, I have a son who's teaching in uh, Wales, and is, uh, you know, he's not experiencing any of this directly, but he sees the evidence of it all around him. Susan uh, has something to say, Susan, I think, by the way, Lloyd. Yeah, yeah we, we are running out of time, I'm afraid. But Susan, yeah. I saw your hand up, and then we have to talk about the husk for a moment. Yeah, that was kind of where I was trying to go oh. in um, linking those nature images and the idea that the scientists are in terror and the Europeans, um, mind, European mind stopped, doesn't have a period made me want to link over tonight under wind mid Gorothony and and go that way and then mm -hmm. the the nature image coming after green time a blown husk that is finished but the light sings eternal a pale fire over marshes with wind. I mean, that just destroys me um, with the mix of the wind and then the blown husk. And it seems to me his punctuation in a way invites us sometimes to mm -hmm. skip lines and, and to link other lines together. And the time space, neither life nor death is the answer could feel so dry but coming after the image of the blown husk and the and the and the Pale rhythm fire. 
of the of the salt grass and the tide and the everlasting nature of that i just that moves me to tears amid all the other things that have have gone on and um mm. of man seeking good doing evil you know the good seems to be connected to the natural world in some way so there is hope in spite of the the cardboard living um i just kept coming and circling back through the poem for the natural images that are so rich and so musical as Kagan said i i, I yeah that's wonderful um I also think there is an element in this of um, autobiography mm -hmm. uh, from moving from my green time to the blown husk that, but the light sings eternal and that, I don't know, art or inspiration or poetry or something continues though even if it's only a pale flare that something there's some something of value that's eternal and that here is you know, that is just a pale flare over marsh marshes that may be just that, where the salt hay whispers to tides change. And that's kind of, again, that's more, that's kind of larger and more, a sort of larger sense of, of the changing world. Uh, but, neither one is the answer, that there is no answer, we, that we can't know an answer. No. Uh, and that we are still in a situation, we're still in a world where some men are seeking good and still doing evil. And that, um, and that's, I don't know, that's his homeland or his metaphorical homeland. Um, um, where the dead walked. I, I mean, I, 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 I have to think about this as a, as a, um, as a reference to the concentration camps. Mm. But I, it's not how I thought about it. Um, and I, maybe I'm just, you know, blocking it out. But um, the dead walked, the dead, Mozart, Linnaeus, Sulmona, Ovid, the dead walked and the living when one's friends hate each other they're they're the they're the living and and he's living and i i, I you know I, I i don't exactly know how to how to put it together but i find something really devastating about that ending which is probably connects all of the things that that you that you've been saying about it and the the things that i've been thinking about but that um um that there's no answer and that it doesn't end um it doesn't end on a positive note it ends on a scary note and um, and I find that very moving and also, yeah, challenging, puzzling. 
I, I don't have I don't have an answer. <laughs> uh, me 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 and time and space. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't have an answer. Oh, go ahead, Susie. Oh, okay. Oh, good. From the green and the blown husk, he's constantly contradicting himself, and and I also relate the pale flare over marshes with the the uh, night under wind. But this is over. But mm -hmm. he says blown husk that is finished. The light seems eternal, and then he contradicts himself. A pale flare over marshes is an ignis fatuous. It disappears. It's ephemeral, and then he, he and then he talks about tides change. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be the heart, and it seems like this is the dissolution of his of his worldview and his beliefs, uh, and the contradiction just continued to the end. This yeah. is the way the world ends. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I I think that's that's right, and and that the poem, just as a poem, keeps all of these things kind of floating and bumping into each other and but not resolving mm. and um i so i don't i don't think we have <laughs> any answers today but we have to let marita go back to work, go back to work and um thank you so much for participating in this and and uh i hope this doesn't leave you too frustrated but um i i i i i i did hope that this would be this 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 would be worth talking about thank you um, yeah, thank you Lloyd. thank you thank you and thank you very much uh, Bill, can you stay? Can you stay on a second after we officially close? I'm uh, gonna which, which, which stop Bill? the recording. Uh, yeah, you, uh, Bill Symes. Yeah, yes, by all means. <laughs>